the Jeep Grand Cherokee was introduced almost 30 years ago. And it only took a few months, if that, before it became, well, maybe a little bit longer than that, before it became one of North America's absolute favorite mid-size SUVs. I so remember seeing my first live 1993 Grand Cherokee, the design, the, the presence, the stance, the, the capabilities, the power, the luxury, everything was going for it, or it had everything going for it, except maybe reliability, but that's in the past now. Um, as the years went by, manufacturers figured that mid-size SUVs had a lot more potential than simply seating five people and while well, offering two rows of seating. So a lot of manufacturers, Ford, all the GM brands, Toyota, Nissan, for example, all began introducing three row, six plus seater versions of their midsize SUVs or, or just simply converting them to three row SUVs. Dodge, part of the FCA, did introduce the Durango and although near and dear to my heart, let's face it, right now it is kind of getting old. But something, something was wrong, right, at FCA, now Stellantis, and that was the fact that their famed Jeep brand did not itself have a three-row mid-size SUV. Yes, there was the Commander. I think it was sold between 2005-2010, and it was, well, to put it simply, a total flop. I, I drove it, reviewed it 15 years ago, and, uh, but that's not the point. It was a flop. It didn't work. It should have, but it didn't. So now we fast forward to, for example, calendar year 2020 and Jeep as part of Stellantis figured, that's it, we're done, we're fixing this. And that's why they are introducing in the 2021 model year or calendar year, I'm sorry, not one, not two, but three, three row large mid-size SUVs, namely the Grand Wagoneer, the Wagoneer, and this 2021 Jeep Grand Cherokee L. That was a short-term loan, fortunately. I picked it up yesterday morning and it's going back tomorrow morning. So I've been maximizing my time with this SUV. And frankly, I can't really find anything fundamentally wrong with the SUV. It's not perfect, obviously. But the, really, the, the real issue I keep coming up with is that, well, Jeep Canada, Jeep Canada doesn't want you to get a Grand Cherokee L because of the way it's packaged and the way it's priced. You'll either end up with a base Grand Cherokee L Laredo when it becomes available, or you'll just switch right over into a Wagoneer. And there are arguments in favor of both, both decisions, if you will. But that's, that'll be for the written review. For the video, what we'll do now, obviously, is we'll go for a walk around of this 2021 Grand Cherokee L, and then we'll take it for a little spin. Oh, I haven't gone very far off-road yet. I'm hoping I'll be able to. Um, but this is obviously a very capable SUV. It is a Jeep after all. Anyhow, enough about that. Let's discover the new 2021 Grand Cherokee L together. Okay, so let's start with something entirely subjective. Uh, I'm not saying that the new Grand Cherokee and Grand Cherokee L aren't attractive. I'm just saying it's not special enough. There is something about the styling that I find bland, partially uninspired, and I think I know why that is. From the moment these vehicles were announced, and I am including the Wagoneer, Grand Wagoneer, and the Grand Cherokee L, we've been bombarded with images of the latter two Wagoneers, as well as Summit Grand Cherokee Ls, which have so much visual impact with the wheels and the chrome and everything else that they've integrated into the design that somehow, even in this lovely velvet red color, the Grand Cherokee L looks plain, almost boring. Maybe it's me, but like I said, this is entirely subjective. I mean, you saw the front end, it's still kind of okay looking. Um, I do like the chrome strip that goes straight across and wraps around the back and continues on to the other side. I mean, it's not ugly, but, and here's the issue. This is why I find it to be kind of plain. And this is what I was talking about when I said uh, pricing structure and packaging. Now, 
we'll just jump right into pricing. In the US, $36,995 for a base Laredo. Uh, they're available, two-wheel drive, sorry, in the US. We do only get four-wheel drive versions. In Canada, the Laredo starts at $52,495. Now, I'm going to skip uh, over all the trim versions and just go right to the Overland. You may have seen the badge. This is a 2021 Overland Grand Cherokee L, which is priced in the US starting at $54,995. In Canada, $68,995. This is where Jeep and Stellantis lose me because the base Wagoneer starts at $69,995. Of the many differences, the key one is that the Grand Cherokee L is powered, as you see it here, with a 3.6 liter V6 engine, whereas the Wagoneer starts with a Hemi 5.7 liter V8. I'm, I'm have a, I have a real hard time with that. Um, but this exact Grand Cherokee L has a lot of options as well. So you're looking at the luxury tech package, which includes 12-way uh, power, massaging front seats, wireless charging, a whole bunch of other stuff. Oh, I forgot to mention the actual Overland includes a number of very specific features, namely the Quadralift air suspension, which is explains why it has about, uh, what is that, 11 inches of ground clearance as it sits at the moment. It's got the Quadra Track 2 4x4 system with a two-speed T-case, so... It shouldn't get stuck. If you do, you're, you're really good and stuck. Trailer tow package and a few other things. So I, I mentioned the luxury tech package. This also has the Uniconnect 5 with a nav package and a 10.1 inch screen, as well as this has the advanced ProTech group, which has a surround view camera, heads up display, and finally the off-road group. And normally this would visually enhance the SUV, but it's just not working. Uh, the off-road group includes the electronic limited slip diff. It's got skid plates, bash plates, everything you need to protect your beloved SUV, expensive SUV, as well as these 18-inch wheels with quote-unquote off-road tires. Normally, I praise and love smaller wheels, bigger tires, but from a visual standpoint, it's boring. I know it's kind of tough to see here with all the grass around the truck, but if you look at the uh, if you look at the image gallery on Motor Illustrated, you'll see much much better pictures. So grand total for this SUV, as it sits, as it stands, as it well there, seventy eight thousand one hundred dollars, or the equivalent in the U.S. of sixty two thousand three hundred dollars. Remember, the Wagoneer starts at sixty nine thousand nine hundred ninety five dollars. Uh, are you? I think you might be starting to get a little bit of the picture why I'm slightly not enchanted with the new Grand Cherokee L. So let's do the usual tour. So, power hatch, obviously. Which reveals when the third row is in place, 490 liters of space. With the second row up, which is down now, thanks to the one... Well, let's try it here. Oh, no, that's right. That's just for down stuff for up. My bad. Third row is power operated. So up to the second row, it's 1,330 liters of boot space. And all the way down, I think it's close to 2,400 liters of trunk volume. Nice little bin down here. Anyhow, there's plenty of space, obviously. Okay. So I've accessed on two occasions now the third row. And it's actually fairly easy to do. Okay, one hand, second row seat goes way forward. It's actually doable back there. Like I've said it before, I'm 5'10", a little bit portly, but I do fit and it's reasonably comfortable. You got a cup holder. You can see it here, there's a little storage pocket, USB, USB-C um, plugs. I slide it back in. Actually quite comfortable rear seats for the second row, the captain seats. There's decent lumbar support too. I, I don't remember noticing that in other vehicles. So obviously there's tons of leg room and you don't always have to put the uh, seat or the second row seat, flip it forward to get to the third row. You can just walk in between. And here's a good view of the dashboard and the 10.1 uh, inch screen. Included in here, HVAC controls down there with more ports to plug in all your toys. This one also has the Macintosh audio system, which, frankly, I haven't had a chance to really test out. Oh, it also has sunshades. Pretty sure you've seen those before. 
All right. So up front, again, very, very comfortable seats. Multi-way adjustable, as I mentioned. Um, could support, good cushioning. Um, typical FCA Stellantis fashion. Fit and finish is pretty good. Materials are nice. Cross-stitching is a lovely touch. And I love the switches for some reason. Just really, really nice. Um, good view. Let's just walk right in. Start her up. Now here's your 10.2 inch, I believe, instrument panel, digital standard for all Grand Cherokee L's, which is a nice touch. Um, here you get an idea of the view. Uh, it's just like the previous Grand Cherokee where this is a massive, massive blind spot. Same with over there, but generally speaking, visibility is okay. Um, good door bins, storage. Again, fit finish, design is nice. The steering wheel is actually really, really lovely with the piano black touches and the cross stitching. Um, so here's your screen, 10.1 inch. It is Uconnect 5 and it is brilliant. The graphics, the resolution is fantastic. Easy to navigate, it's lovely. Now here's your suspension control settings. As you can see, I'm in the highest setting. Your off-road modes, which is actually kind of nice. It's just a series of little toggles to change from one mode to the other. I've found so far auto to be the best, but I'll touch on that in a few moments. This is an unfortunate thing. Again, I won't, I won't spend too much time on it, but if you go into D and you're doing a three point turn, if you slip it and you drop it, or I don't know, I still do a DP. Oh boy, that's terrible. Uh, when I'm doing a three point turn, when all I want to do is uh, drive in reverse. Storage is still pretty good. Big bin in here. Look, it's a lovely place to be in. Plenty of room. Um, and the drive is actually really, really good. So let's see uh, what lies ahead and see if I can make my way in and out of that. I suppose what I'm saying about the pricing and the packaging and all that is that I get the impression that especially for 80 grand as tested or 78 and change or even at 70,000 for the base overland, I feel like I'm paying way too much for just a little bit too little. Even so, with the overland, I mean, this air suspension which will lower the truck as low as 6.5 inches of ground clearance yeah yeah that'll happen a lot uh, or all the way up to 10.9 inches which is where it's at right now as i go back through my little off-road course um, doesn't only enable the grand cherokee l to cross these well for this suv mildly annoying terrains it also means that on the road, it is extremely comfortable, cost-sitting. Uh, it is, I don't know, it, it, it makes this SUV extremely refined, or it, it just increases the level of refinement and factor that in on top of this entirely new platform, which is stiffer, stronger, and all of the above. So definitely that's a win-win. Uh, the uh, Quadratrack 2 and the two-speed transfer case. I mean, right now I'm not even in four-wheel drive low. I'm just in sand mud, keeping a steady throttle. And uh, look, this, we might as well be on a completely flat surface or on pavement. It really makes no difference for this SUV. Um, the, the issue that I have really is, is, again, that perceived return on your investment. I'm gonna go back into auto because now it's just grass. The 3.6 liter V6, right? It's the same engine you get in a Wrangler or you get in a Pacifica. 
and this is a premium SUV for $70,000, just based on the Overland. Let's just focus on that right away. As I mentioned, the Wagoneer gets the 5.7 liter Hemi V8. Uh, if you look into a Yukon or a Tahoe, not only is it less than 60 to start, but you get the 5.3 liter V8 with the 10 speed automatic transmission. You get so much more perceived value in the other SUVs than you do in the Grand Cherokee. If I'm not mistaken, the 5.7 liter is, I think, a $3,000 option, I believe, which doesn't help its case at all, because then you have to spend even more to get what the others more or less already have. And apologies for the shaking. Now I'm on gravel, so we're going to have to deal with this for a few more minutes. Um, it's not that the engine is underpowered per se, 293 horsepower, 260 pound-feet of torque. That's just, you don't boast about those numbers. You'll boast about your 5.7 or your 5.3. Um, but look, all that torque is available from like 1,800 to 6,000 RPM. Something like 90% of the torque is available throughout the power band, which, which enables this SUV that weighs no less than 5,000 pounds to, you know, get up and go. But mind you, because it's a short-term lease loan, I haven't used it that much, and I've been alone in the SUV. So figure you add, you know, total of about 500 pounds of family members, give or take, with some gear in the back. And if you do uh, decide to test this SUV, 6,200 pounds of towing capacity, I don't know, that 3.6 is going to be stretched to within an inch of its life or so it would seem. Eight-speed automatic transmission has been flawless the whole time. I mean, as always, an eight-speed is a sweet spot, but then, you know, 10-speed in the GM trucks. I like the brakes, I like the steering. I mean, all in all, this is not a bad SUV. As I've said, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with this truck. The issue is what's right across I don't know how the Wagoneer is going to work, but I figured they'll be set up in Jeep showrooms. But just across the way in the showroom, you'll have a Wagoneer priced within reach of this. So for $25 more a month, you'll get a premium, a true premium luxury SUV called a Wagoneer. And if you want to spend six figures in Canada anyway, you'll get a Grand Wagoneer. And then there's the GM trio of trucks. Well, let's just say dual. We'll exclude the, the Escalade. Uh, which I find better looking, uh, as well equipped, just as spacious, if not even more. Those are full-size trucks. I get it, but they're priced comparatively. So it's not GM's fault or the Grand Cherokee's fault. It's just the way it was priced and packaged. Again, I, I, I really like the SUV, but I thought I was going to absolutely go gaga over it and love it for everything that it is and stands for fact of the matter is I'm a little disappointed maybe if this was a lower trim at say $65,000 as opposed to $78,000 I would be more into it because it would make more sense Anyhow, it's a great truck but uh, especially if you're gonna lease it or finance it at first uh, expect the rates to be really high and uh, Stellantis won't offer some incredible deals and incentives at first because they're introducing and launching a brand brand new SUV so you might have to seriously consider looking elsewhere at least at first and then we'll see it's a great truck it's a great truck but I don't know what Stellantis Canada is thinking it's priced out of its own range category anyhow that's it